Due to time, let me just say thank you very much to Jan for inviting me to be here and also to, um, you know, I look forward even more so to the kinds of discussions and what I learned from you today. My approach is um, sort of taking on from Diana, you know, and, and assuming that Diana's messages are learned. <laughs> But it is tending to be more um, experiential because I have, for purposes of whether it is ordinary or not, work uh, in an interdisciplinary way all my life. I think it is because I, it is impossible for me when I start to deal with something without beginning to see the other ways in which, the, you know, how disciplines naturally lead me. So my disciplines themselves have moved from economics to sociology to um, history, to now I deal with visuality, aesthetics, um, and all of it combined under some rubric called development studies. <laughs> and I have worked with a globalization pro with a project on, on global democracy, but you know, it is combined. So um, one of the things that I noted, and I wanted Jan yeah, to stop me at any point so I can summarize if I'm going too long, because one tends to do that. So, you know, I'm very happy to stop and summarize very quickly and we need time for discussion. One of the things that um, I noted, the Vice Chancellor started by saying that a key feature of the future is interdisciplinarity. And it's interesting that prominent in your discussions and in your, in your paper, in that discussion paper that was um, distributed that the, all of the various streams spoke to the value added of a cross-departmental and interdisciplinary approach. And it is interesting for me that the value of interdisciplinary and cross-departmental collaboration has already been confronted because and what I'm going to do here is draw really a lot of my, of, a lot of my experience, as Diana has done, you know, in a very personal way perhaps, as I tend to speak. Um, it reminds me that in the early development of women and gender studies in the mid-80s in the Caribbean, I held the post of the regional course director in seminars over three campuses of the UWI. If you don't know them, they are Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados. And we had to, I had to work firsthand with all the faculties on each campus in setting up a series of interdisciplinary seminars in women and gender studies. The aim was to develop a full-fledged undergraduate program of teaching and to stimulate a body of interdisciplinary research projects and research publications. That would, in fact, populate the area of the newly developing area of women and development studies and gender studies. Now, there was a taken for granted assumption on our part that scholars who we roped in to think about gender would automatically understand the value of interdisciplinary work. We found that all of them were keen to put their disciplines under scrutiny to see what it added to their knowledge and interest in the discipline itself. In fact, cross-departmental interdisciplinary collaborations work more in teaching than in research. So one of the earliest su successes was the, gener was the generation of cross-disciplinary and cross-departmental courses that brought together historians, linguists, language scholars, sociologists, literary scholars, and so on. The areas like the um, humanities and social sciences were more easily brought in then. Um, bastions like engineering have remained completely out of it. Natural sciences later were brought in. Um, medicine became a, an interestingly good bedfellow there as well, of course, because of issues of health. But in fact, the, some disciplines were more easily brought in than others. The research itself as interdisciplinary took rather longer. First, because people really did not v understand the value of interdisciplinary work. And secondly, because crossing boundaries was a relatively new concept in the, in the university system then. The challenges of referencing, the pressures of um, what was the presumed softening of a discipline, because people th tend to think that when you cross disciplines, you were softening your own. Um, for instance, history was always a hard nut to crack. I don't know if they're historians here. Yes. <laughs> but his historians think that they work in this historical way. I've done history. 
in a historical way, and their method is objective and scientific, because these, oh, these papers use that all, you know, having passed through the test of time, have all become sanctified as documents, without their subjectivity that was involved in making in the first place. So, you know, you, you tend to have these two <coughs> But I think it is planned, he has to be more than an enforced approach by institutions or programs. The scholars who are really and truly interdisciplinary are drawn to it because they see the value of synthesis of new approaches and methods. They recognize the limits of their own disciplines in understanding the problems they set out to study. And they are also inspired to some extent by what this openness can mean to their own worldview and knowledge base and how they can meaningfully impact on the needs of people of the societies that they serve. Now, how do we bring together different disciplines and various actors and projects to achieve what this panel has point, um, set out, effective interdisciplinarity? And I interpret effective interdisciplinarity in two ways. First, how, we, how, we, how do we work productively and creatively in a sustained in this interdisciplinary way within the academic system? Because disciplines, as we know, are both fixed and unfixed. Um, in fact, disciplines over time present a consistent picture of disciplinary fragmentation, even if, as adherents, we hold firmly to the, to sub, the subject matter problems, theories, and methods that inform the ambit of the discipline. For instance, I think Kuhn's, um, Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolution is still one of the most valuable um, treatises on how disciplines themselves uh, are constantly expanding their boundaries. The second problem I want to raise though is how, and because a lot of my work has actually been the interface between the academic and the activist and the practical and the policy. So the second problem that I, that I want to raise in the question of interdisciplinary research and particularly in a project which deals with global governance is how do we interface with these disciplines that come to be socially embedded and practically realized with respect to a larger external society of governments, institutions, industry, non-governmental institutions, and civil society. If the university has its boundaries, so do the expectations of it. So achieving interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary goals in the area of global studies and global governance to me requires that we find some happy marriage between these two components, the university, the ambit of the discipline, as well as those with whom we work. Now the further examples I would deal with, and I, need to, I want to deal with three, and as I told you, I can stop at any point, but, but let me start off, start with them. I want to use three uh, which are primarily illustrative rather than prescriptive by any means with respect to global governance. And they are drawn from the two subject areas that I have primarily been preoccupied with in my lifetime as an academic scholar, policy maker. And that is gender development studies and cultural studies. Interestingly, both of these areas are characterized by their interdisciplinarity, stroke multidisciplinarity, and in our early heady days of feminism and gender studies, we even talked about transdisciplinarity which I know we still keep talking about and trying to figure out what we mean. Um, both of these areas, um, gender development studies, cultural studies, are unfortunately still met with dismissive, or at best, patronizing attitudes in the academy and elsewhere. They are seen as soft studies, not hardcore ones like economics and law and you know, medicine and so on. But I, reading the overview of this, um, your, your paper, your discussion paper, I don't think that at this time global studies will be presenting the same kinds of challenges that we were confronted with, with gender studies and cultural studies. I think global studies are already located in far more steady ground, if you like, given the contemporary needs. But there is, and I want to repeat Diana's point, that there is a risk taken always involved in doing interdisciplinary work. And that risk taking, as I will end up with, is in fact the challenge, but also the, the, the um, pleasure of it. Because at the end of the day, if you sustain interdisciplinary work, what you realize is you come out ahead 
of people who've been safe. Because you have a lifetime. You know, we all have lifetimes as scholars. And if you are safe, you end up narrowing and being and constricting yourself, your thought, your idea. If you are unsafe, if you take risks, um, I suspect it works in money, <laughs> in investment. You know, you end up with, with far more at the end of it. And I think you deal with it just frankly, almost, if I may, with some of that same gambling. Now, I'm drawing on three examples. The first one, um, very quickly, is the one in teaching, located in teaching and supervision from an interdisciplinary perspective. Because of the way I work, most of my, my supervision is interdisciplinary. Um, Right now, I'm supervising about between nine and ten students drawn from the Caribbean, all over the Caribbean, as well as one or two internationally. And each of them presents another problem of crossing boundaries. And for me, it is exciting because it forces me all the time to have to confront what they are telling me and, and broaden my own scope. A lot of some of this, though, is done jointly because interdisciplinary research requires, and interdisciplinary supervision requires cross, that you, you co-supervise a lot because none of us are, are expert fully in the year, and that has its own challenges. And I want to give you one example, which I'll try and summarize very quickly. A recent student, and it was almost, I, I don't want to deal with the negatives, but I think we have to take this on. That this was a, a, an actual failure on our part. This student was attempting, she um, was attempting to divide, develop ideas on the cosmology of the early Saladoid group of peoples who moved from the mainland of South America to Trinidad. Now, you may not know, these are the earliest people before the colonial encounters. And she attempted to use a materials approach, understand the science of the material use in pottery, using newly developed technologies of science that, were, that have recently been uncovered, laser technologies to understand the clays, the dyes they were used, how they were fired, and so on. She's also, at the same time, looking at designs on pottery and shards of evidence on the last century in archaeology, archaeological digs, comparing these, um, comparing the icon iconography of designs with symbols of masculinity and femininity that were sculpted or inscribed in other cosmologies, and trying to, and in other, trying through this to, to emerge with some understanding of this group, of which little was known. A primary supervisor was an archaeologist. I came to supervision from the point of view of gender as well as iconography, and the thesis was being carried out in the, under the auspices of a cultural studies program, because there was no PhD program in um, archaeology. And the, the conflicts became a quarrel, or not a quarrel, confrontations, challenges between the archaeology, the discipline of archaeology, the program, which was cultural studies, which assumed and presumed that it had its own frameworks and theoretical and methodological frames that she was supposed to have been, you know, have defined for them. And um, the other challenge, well, not so much challenge, the other kinds of intent that she set up. And eventually, caught between all of this, she gave up on trying to do a page. She ended up done, having done two or three years, you know, refine it into a kind of empty pieces. And I think one of, you know, this for me was a, a failure. Because there's a way in which, as you work in interdisciplinary teams like this, you have to also be open to the new method, new frameworks, new kinds of approaches that you have to allow a new student to maybe forge, because there has to be some pathway through this. And so the issue here is <coughs> the achieving interfect, effective interdisciplinary for me requires, you know, there's no formula. I think it requires how scholars come together, how disciplines come together, and how, how you work together to be able to achieve the goal of that student rather than what you set, what you think, what you hold fast to as your concern, because that is the way new knowledge is forged. And so there's that, that first message, if you like. The second message, how am I going with time? Right. The second area that I want to consider is that of interdisciplinarity and, it, and its links to policy. And the, 
I was talking to James Harrison last night, and I know they already you are doing that with, with your projects with law. So there's a lot of relationship there with the kinds of projects that you are doing. The area of women and gender studies, you know, as I said, is, is one that, that um, I've drawn on. And the, the perspectives which are, they've required by definition, we've required different disciplinary inquiry to arrive at that new knowledge in gender studies because otherwise gender has remained, you know, an invisible component, an invisible part of our, our, our um, the way our societies have seen itself, certainly up until the late 20th century. <coughs> now, through various global initiatives and increasing understanding of gender discrimination and gender equality and equity, Caribbean states who are signed on to or have ratified global conventions, such as the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDO Convention, which is um, signed in 1979, or devised in 1970, and whose constitutions are all informed by, you know, principles of human rights, have been committed to producing national policies on gender equality and equity. I have thus far been the primary architect of four national gender policies in the Caribbean, one in the Cayman Islands, one in the Commonwealth of Dominica, one in Trinidad and Tobago, and most recently the British Virgin Islands, which was very recently completed. Of these three, have three national gender policies have been successfully negotiated with their cabinets and governments. The one for Trinidad and Tobago has remained a battlefield for several years between the church and the state for many other reasons, and maybe the most interesting as a case study for policy makers. But the issues that have to be raised here is how do we work in an interdisciplinary way to achieve effective intervention with policy? On the one hand, the mandates of university now leave us no choice but to demonstrate our relevance to society. But I think as good citizens, all academics are equally committed to policies that make a difference. All policies are research driven, but they are also based on consultation of another kind, on collaborations with government officials, non-government organizations, and interface with community on what works and what does not work, and why they, why they will not work, even if, as academics, we provide the best academic solutions. The gender policy teams that I have led have comprised health experts, lawyers, econ economists, gender specialists, who are experts in gender mainstreaming, education, and so on. To ensure that the policy process is successfully driven while we carry out the necessary academic research on demographics, economic statistics, poverty, violence, court details, and so on. The dialogues and consultations with nurses, doctors, church leaders, trade unionists, community leaders, ministers, permanent secretaries, media and immigration officials are all vital as comp research components of a policy. Everything is processed through the analytical lens of the research team, but interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity here takes on not a strictly academic approach, but what I, what I tend to call an ethnographic one that allows for information that flows from another direction and many directions. Now I want um, to emphasize <coughs> this point with the value of interdisciplinarity and the way interdisciplinarity actually helps us to, to, to get successful policy by, by using one example from the British Virgin Islands. Every time you go to, to carry out one of the national gender policies, you, you are you are faced with communities that say, this is not a problem. You know, we don't think this is a problem. But as you search, you realize this is the problem that they are not speaking about, and that governments don't want to confront. And in the Virgin Islands, where half the population as they are born migrate to British, to, you know, because they have UK citizenship, or the US Virgin Islands is typical. Half the population actually lives there, and so the government only half have voting privilege. The rest of people, the nurses, the doctors, the professionals, a lot of the, the teachers actually are migrants from the other Caribbean islands. And, what, and they have non-belonger status. They are actually called non-belongers. According to immigration, and I'm just being facetious, say that you know, your grandmother has to have 
your maternal grandmother plus your paternal grandfather has to have been born in the Virgin Islands to become belongers. So, but that's not actually true. Anyway, it basically is as difficult as that. We had to find a way to ensure that questions of immigration and immigration law will, in fact, be key part of that policy. And the only way we could do it was, in fact, using the legal team, lawyers, who had to argue on the basis of human rights and other areas of legal discrim of discrimination to be able to incorporate it. And, and I think that was the, you know, the, the, the value of having that interdisciplinary team that allowed for one, one discipline to be able to, to sell another one. Now, Jan is telling me to wrap up, so the, the, for the third example, I will simply speak through because this is the one that, that I, that most fascinates me now and, and involves me in life. And that is that I've, I've somehow um, chameleon, chameleonized now in term. After many years of being a you know, writer, because um, I published widely and so on, into trying to have my work translated into a medium that allows me to speak to a much larger audience without dumbing it down, without taking material and making it um, less complex to a wide audience. And that is through the medium of film. And I found myself processing very difficult kinds of material into a very accessible film, documentary film. And I'm not strictly speaking, straightforwardly, non-entertaining. But at the same time, allowing me to speak to, to a large audience. And for instance, just one example, my PhD research from the 1980s. In 2000, by 2009, I produced a film that was called Coolie Pink and Green. My PhD research was on migrant, Indian my post-migrants from an indentured situation. By 2009, I produced a film that had in 25 minutes encapsulated much of what I had wanted to see since that time. This film was um, played at the screen at the National Film Festival, won the Best Film Award, invited to India um, at, the, at New Delhi, opened a film festival there, has been shown all over the world, it keeps being shown all over the world. Because it's like a long Hollywood, a long Bollywood video in many ways. You know, I use it. The materials and methods, I use the formats, but I was playing into what can be, what is absorbed, but at the same time using very, very serious um, methods of inquiry. And so the point I want to end with here is, I don't know if I've gone off your track, but to say that the third thing is that what makes interdisciplinary work exciting and what makes it interdisciplinary exciting is that you have to conceive of methods and formats for presenting data, um, which in fact is another kind of interdisciplinarity because I have to then work with production teams, cross-country production teams. The next the new film I'm going to make, I want to work with India and the UK. Um, you have to engage in you know, many, many kinds of skills and competencies that you don't know, and which in fact enhance your understanding of what you think you know. So I've worked in visuality. Um, I've written a book on, on iconography. But when I was <coughs> film, then I understood what writing by light meant. And then I began to understand the thing that I was doing before, far more. And so my last point, because I know I have to shut up on the, on the other um, things I wanted to see, but can come out in discussion, is that as you work with interdisciplinarity, think of ways in which your work can can bridge other um, gaps, can, can, can make other bridges. Because I might, again, going back to what the Vice Chancellor said, interdisciplinarity is the future, but new formats are also the future. Media interventions are the future. How universities make themselves relevant. I've worked as a dean of graduate studies and research in my university the last five or six years, working on senior management, strategic planning, and clearly that is where the direction is. How you maintain the integrity of your, your intellectual work, but at the same time, make what you do relevant available. And I think that is, in fact, what our mandates are anyway, as universities. So with that, I thank you, and I hope we can engage in discussions again. Thank you. <laughs>